Good morning. This is Richfield Lutheran Church's video worship service for May 12th, the seventh and final Sunday of Easter. I'm Pastor Brian. With me today are Paul on the organ and Mary as our vocalist. The printed bulletin for the service can be found on our website, richfield-lutheran.org. Our gospel today is John chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. The gospel for Easter's seventh Sunday is always taken from the long prayer Jesus prays for his followers on the night before his death, and always includes Jesus' desire that his followers will be one, as he and the Father are one. This oneness is not mere doctrinal agreement or institutional unity, but mutual abiding, interpenetrating life, mutual love, and joy. This oneness is the work of the Spirit, whom we have received but also await. Come, Holy Spirit. Our prelude is Pastorel by Purvis. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Our gathering hymn is Christ is made the sure foundation.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, you have chosen us as your own, and by the powerful name of Christ, you protect us from evil. By your Spirit, transform us and your beloved world, that we may find joy in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Gospel is John chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. In this reading, the Church hears Jesus' words on the night before his death, his prayer for his disciples, and for all who would believe in him through their words. This is the Holy Gospel according to John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus prayed, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and that they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All yours are mine, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in the name you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you had given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they may also be sanctified in truth. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In one of the churches I served, there was this huge, dark, stained glass window, and it depicted Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he is, collapsed across this uncomfortable-looking boulder. Storm clouds build in the distance. His hands are tightly folded. His face is strained. He looks to heaven imploringly. It is a tense scene. Jesus is hard at work here. What is he praying for here? You know, Jesus prays a lot. It makes me wonder that Jesus prays a lot. I mean, he is God. While he is praying to God, his Father, you know, there's still one God, yet three persons. All that confusing Trinity stuff. But still, they seem to be in conversation a lot. A lot. And if Jesus needs to pray to be in conversation with God the Father a lot, I imagine we need to be in prayer even more so those of us who are mere mortals. What do Jesus and his Heavenly Father talk about all that time? Well, today's Gospel reading is Jesus' prayer, late on Monday, Thursday, after the Last Supper, right before the authorities come to the Garden of Gethsemane and arrest him. Jesus knows his time is marked. So what does he do, knowing he has but hours to live? Jesus prays. What does Jesus pray for? He prays for us. Jesus' dying prayer is for you and me. Jesus is leaving. He'll be back for a while after he rises from the dead on Easter morning, but then he'll be gone, at least as the disciples know him, for a very, very long time. True, he's coming again, but until then he is gone, at least in the physical sense. and The disciples will be by themselves for a very, very long time. How will they fare without him there? Well, he warned them, saying, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. 
Peter blurts out, even though all become deserters, I will not. Hmm. We know how that plays out. Before the rooster crows his morning wake-up call the next day, Peter will have denied Jesus three times. Yeah. Sad to say, Jesus has good reason to be concerned about his disciples. For the next few hours, when the authorities take him away, all his followers will abandon him. One will betray him, one will deny him, and all will abandon him. All. Jesus is leaving, and his dying prayer is for his disciples. His dying prayer is that they be one, just as Jesus and God the Father are one. Be one. Seems an elusive thing. Why can't we all just get along? It seems like division is becoming more and more a problem. I mean, we just can't be civil anymore. Politicians and the hosts of TV news and talk shows all ratchet up this loud, angry war of words. We're uncomfortable with all this hot, combative posturing. So to turn down the heat, we retreat into caves with other people like us. People who are like us. People who agree with us. Sometimes I fear that is what church has become, a voluntary association of like-minded individuals. Yet Jesus' dying prayer is for his followers to be one. <laughs> if there's one thing the Christian church is not, it's not one. It seems there are all sorts of things we can't agree upon. Is the Bible inspired or inerrant? Abortion? Ever? Never? Can you baptize babies or you wait until the age of reason only? Then you have the whole sprinkling versus immersion thing. Evolution or intelligent design? Should women be pastors? How about having a gay or transgender pastor or bishop? War, climate change, guns. Do we use a hymnal or read our hymns off the screen? Organ or guitar or ukulele? Do we use prepared prayers or off-the-cuff ones? Is giving money to the homeless helpful, or does it just encourage them to be lazy? Do we give 10% of gifts to the sin of benevolence, or should it just be spent locally? Do you use automatic deduction, or just give when you're here? Do you take communion every time, or is just once every now and then good enough? Do we schedule church events around football games, or should we ignore the sports schedule entirely? Is it the classic Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, or the new Lord's Prayer, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name? Do we serve wine or grape juice or both for communion? Well, so forth and so on. The list of things that divide us goes on and on, doesn't it? It eventually reaches the point where one group of Christians denounces another group, saying, you can't believe what you believe and still be Christian. I'm sure this is not what Jesus had in mind when he prayed for us to be one, as he and God the Father are one. Imagine Satan is smiling, because the church has unwittingly taken up with the ways of the world, warlike ways of my way or the highway, rather than God's ways of steadfast grace. Now, don't get me wrong, many of these questions and issues are important and need to be worked through. But is there some way we can be in mutual conversation with the other, as Jesus is in conversation with God the Father? Jesus knew this was going to happen. He warned us so. Even though, like Peter, well, we promise we'll be different. More important than warning us about this, Jesus takes matters into his own hands and prays for us, his followers, to be one. He prays for us, his church, to be one, just as Jesus and God the Father are one. This is Jesus' dying prayer. How fitting that Mother's Day is today. Jesus' prayer reminds me of the dying wish and prayer of many a mother. What is a mother's most heartfelt wish for her family after she's gone? That they be one. That they continue to be a family. Too much of the time, the only thing holding a family together is mom. It seems all the children are always fighting and disagreeing so that if not for mom, they would all just spin off, off the family. And mom knows this. So she prays that they continue to be a family even after she is gone. Just like a mom, Jesus' heartfelt wish and prayer is to see all God's children around the table together in conversation with each other, to be one, 
Just as Jesus and God the Father are one. There's that Trinity mystery again. One God and yet three persons. One and yet separate individuals. Together and yet distinct. I think that's an important point. When Jesus prays for us to be one, his concern is for us to be like the Trinity. Three persons sitting around the table together engaging in conversation. That is one of the more enduring pictures of the Trinity. So imagine that this is what oneness looks like for us too. Sitting around the table in the fellowship hall, sharing coffee and conversation, sharing what is on my heart and hearing what is on your heart. Perhaps this is why communion is so vital to the life of the Christian. Here we all gather around the table, if only for a few minutes. The kingdom of God breaking into our here and now, if only for a few minutes. This image of the Trinity, one God and yet three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is not one of uniformity. They are not identical triplets all blurred together. No, they remain distinctly separate individuals. So it is with Jesus' image of the Church, of the Kingdom of God. Two weeks ago we heard of the vine and the branches, hundreds and thousands of individual branches all held together as one in the vine that gives them life. And we have the Apostle Paul's familiar image of the Church as the body of Christ, composed of countless parts, all very different, with different strengths and different weaknesses, and yet the body needs all of them and working together for the body to thrive. So it is with us, different people, different strengths, different weaknesses, but all working together in one common vision. No, we are not all the same. We are not uniformly identical. We even have differing understandings on questions and issues important to us. Nevertheless, when we can sit down to table together and engage in conversation, sharing and hearing, then we are one, just as Jesus and God the Father are one. This does not mean that we will be without disagreement or conflict. <laughs> Do you remember what the name Israel means in Hebrew? Well, remember how God wrestled with Jacob, that sly old schemer at the river Jabbok in the book of Genesis. Jacob hung in there and kept wrestling with God. God had to throw Jacob's hip out of joint before Jacob would give in. Then God gave Jacob a new name and a new identity. His name was now Israel. Israel became the name of all God's chosen people, including us. Now, do you remember what the name Israel means? It means he who wrestles with God. That is, it always won't be easy. Sometimes we have to hang in there and wrestle with God to figure out what God is up to. We have to hang in there. It might take some time and effort, and also with each other. Dialogue and conversation can be very hard, like a wrestling match, especially when we hear God differently, when we have different understandings of what God is up to. But somehow in all this wrestling, which we usually call by its theological name, discernment, together we figure out what God is up to in this place. Discernment can be hard, can be unpleasant, and I don't know if I can do it. But you know what? Jesus knows that we cannot do it on our own. And that's why he prays for us. When we can sit down at a table with one another and share and hear, especially when it comes to a troublesome question or issue, that is God at work. This is the kingdom of God breaking into our here and now, if only for a few minutes. This is Jesus' promise for you, for us, that we be one. Notice that Jesus keeps praying that we be one, as Jesus and God the Father are one, sitting down to table together and sharing and listening with one another. This is the kingdom of God. Let us be one. And to that end, Jesus prays for us. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Our hymn of the day is Son of God, Eternal Savior. of life.
Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. You sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Send your church out into the world to spread your love and joy. Embolden all bishops, pastors, and deacons to be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your creation groans under the strain of pollution. Preserve melting glaciers and dwindling forests. Bolster those who work for climate justice and help us all to be good and faithful stewards of your creation. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your people seek wisdom, understanding, and peace. Guide all those who govern and inspire them to work on behalf of the most vulnerable in our midst. Keep safe first responders, those serving in the military, and those whose duty it is to protect others. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your children need your loving care. Protect them from all harm. Comfort those in any affliction, especially the people of Ukraine, the people of Palestine and Israel, and those whom we now name in our hearts. Support those who grieve and bring solace to those near death. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your spirit lives within us here. Inspire the work of this congregation and unite us as one. Bless all the mothers in our midst. Console those for whom this day is difficult and gather us all under the care of your loving wings. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your saints dwell with you in light. Keep us ever thankful for those who have gone before us in faith. Inspire us by their witness. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love. Through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. You can support this and other of God's ministries through Richfield Lutheran Church today via our website, richfield-lutheran.org slash give. Thank you for your faithful generosity. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. On May 12th, in addition to this video recording and its phone-in option, we have in-person worship at 9.30. Choir is singing. Afterwards, we share fellowship. All are welcome. Next Sunday, May 19th, is Pentecost Sunday. Our Gospel reading is John chapter 15, verses 16 through 27, and chapter 16, verses 5 through, or 4 through 15. While speaking to his disciples before his death, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the Helper and describes the difference the Spirit will make in their lives and in the world. Until then, go forth with God's blessing. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen to thee. Alleluia. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and always. Amen. Our sending hymn is Crown Him with Many Crowns. Oh,
victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Alleluia. Go in peace. Rejoice and be glad. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Our postlude is Fugue in G Minor by Bach. <laughs> 